So, um, this talk, so maybe as a, as a precursor, I used to be a cognitive scientist, uh, then I got distracted by machine learning, realized that machine learning is a lot of fiddling with parameters and hyperparameters and folk wisdom and trying to figure out what works and doesn't work and got dissatisfied by that. Um, uh, but while doing so, I ended up uh, working on Julia, working on the Julia GPU compiler, and now I self-identify as a compiler developer um, and uh, looking up from beneath most of the levels of abstraction that you work on um, and try to make them work as best as possible for your use cases. And so in some sense, this is a compiler developer pu pushing his head above the wave uh, and trying to tell you, hey, by the way, a few things about Julia. Um, when I was thinking about how to structure this talk, I didn't want to jump into the deep end and talk about all the compiler things that uh, get me all excited. And I figured that maybe we do an exploration of parallel programming. The thing I want you to think about, then we do a little bit of an exploration of uh, Julia, why I'm excited about Julia still after many years of working on it. Um, and then at the very end, there is a tiny excursion into automatic differentiation because it turns out um, that compilers are really good at doing automatic differentiation and it turns out the funding is in machine learning. So if you can claim that we make machine learning better, uh, you also get more funding. <laughs> so thinking about parallels. So for me, when I um, look at a problem, there are two ways of going about it. I can say I have a method that I want to use and I want to parallelize that method. And then after I've done so, I can think about, well, I have some hardware I also have to use. My university bought a fancy new cluster machine, and I want to make most, the most use of it. Can I also apply this parallelization to that cluster machine? The other way of thinking about it is, I have resources, hardware resources. What kind of algorithm and numerical methods best work on these systems? And depending on where you're coming from, uh, the either one might be, might be easier, but if you box yourself in and you might uh, use a, a numerical method that really doesn't like to be run on a distributed machine, you might have to invest a lot of time reworking your code. So in this talk, this talk is an experiment, so I would encourage you to interrupt me at any given time if you either can't read something or have questions or uh, I didn't make myself clear. Um, I saw this picture two weeks ago at a conference, and uh, it talked about the mountain of abstractions. It talked that hardware sits down here, and it's the lowest level of abstraction. We can't generalize it very much. And then we start having programming models, like in Julia, I would call it a for loop, or CUDA-style programming, and I end up here. And the compiler can do some work. And as uh, David Hamm yesterday said, the only trick a computer scientist really has is to do abstractions. Um, and so can we build on top of these building blocks more powerful abstractions the way you can, can exploit more knowledge out of them? And so in Julia, we have something called kernel abstractions that I wrote, which is a uh, performance parallelism toolkit that then other people use to build array abstractions, which then other people use to build tools like Trixie, which is a final element solver, or Tulio, which is a Einstein sum style parallelism toolkit. And you can pick any point along this graph, but if you're looking at a framework, it sometimes happens that they try to hide these details away from you. But because they're hiding these details away from you, they might be easier to use, but they're harder to maximize harder to extract the most performance out of. Because the question is, does the framework that I use actually work properly for the situation I'm in? And so to emphasize that I'm not a computational fluid dynamicist, I'm going to look at the most stupidest and simplest problem that I could imagine. The reason why I'm doing that is because I don't want you to focus on computation I want you to think about data and data movement. 
So we're going to solve a five-point stencil, um, where, and we are going to simply use uh, do the diffusion. So we're, we're not, not going to do anything interesting in that terms. So we're not even doing diffusion advection. Just going to do diffusion. And um, the problem with this, in some ways, is that we have memory accesses for our array that are nice, and we have memory accesses that we have in our array that are not nice. The north and south component, in some ways, are not nice memory accesses because I can't really amortize the cost of them that well. So, if, that, if it's row major. If it's row major, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'm thinking, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> however, one, however you want to transpose the picture. Um, so, welcome to your first code of the lines of Julia. Um, it hopefully doesn't look scary. Um, also, as an aside, I'm using Pluto, which is an uh, alternative to Jupiter. We like Jupiter a lot, it's great, but the Jupiter has a problem that when I change a cell, everything else doesn't change. And in contrast, in uh, Pluto, I can go in here, I can change my n to be 512, and you can see there's a little bit processing, and suddenly my image down here is 512 as well. So it's a reactive notebook, and it solved this problem that um, Jupyter notebooks are only valid in the order that they have been run, and if it's not the order in which it's written, they're in irreproducible. Um, it does some things that I disagree with, like I'm really annoyed about the fact that they print everything at top of the code. Um, but those are moral issues that I can live with. Um, so we, we're going to import a package images. Images is nice because like, it allows me to work with uh, PNGs and other data structures. Um, and I, I can visualize quite easily just random matrices. And so in the next line here, I'm going to allocate some zero data. And earlier today, uh, I, I, in, during the coffee break, I said that Julia was basically Python but NumPy being part of the basic language. So these are, this zero is giving me something that is a NumPy-like array. It is not a linked list. It is an actual shaped array with multiple dimensions. And then you sometimes see up here like things being printed that look kind of more complicated. So every time you see a colon colon, that's a type of. And so we have a view of a matrix, so a two-dimensional array, where the element types are float64. And so in contrast to Python, by default, we have to worry about the bit width of our data types. So we have support for float64, float32, float16. Um, and so I can create a view, which I've done here, and then I basically initialize the inner region of my array to be one, so that we have something that happens when we later look at uh, the pictures. Um, I'm going to set up my, my first diffusion code. And so I'm going to initialize um, an array that looks similar to my input, which is just saying I want something that's equal size, equal data type. Don't want to worry about it. I am then going to zero it out. Um, actually, don't need to zero it out. That's OK. Anyway, <laughs> things you realize when you actually then start looking at your code. Um, and then I'm going to loop over all of the interior points um, of my array. I'm using the outer points for my boundary conditions. And I'm going to loop over them, and I have some kernel, which is doing some stencil-like exercises. In this code, it is uh, implementing the fusion kernel. And then I have here this, every time you see this dot, that means podcasting in Julia. And so if you're used to NumPy, which also had podcasting or MATLAB since 2018, 2019, um, it is doing an operation that is across the elements. And podcasting is interesting because it also does um, shape expansion. So then I can um, initialize the parameters and I can say 
I have uh, maybe a diffusion constant <coughs> that I want to modify. You can see down here every time I move my slider, it updates the value. Um, and the same thing, I want to be able to like simulate 10 time steps. Um, then I calculate my dt, my, my time, the size of my time step, and then I can do apply a simple uh, apply my function here with my input arguments as usual, and then I use k dot to podcast and convert it into an image. Now, a lot of re mo uh, modern programming languages are object oriented. Julia has structs. So you can um, organize data, but we don't have classes. So everything is in this um, functional way. It is not a functional programming language, but everything is organized in functions. And since I want to simulate time moving forward, I might have a very simple step function here where I take in a function f. I have my initial state. I have for how long I want, how many time steps I want to take. And then I apply the function over and over and return the output. And so now we can see that with 10 time steps, it goes from not fuzzy to slightly fuzzy. So that's the only image that's going to be see over and over again. Um, if it's slightly fuzzy, it works. So, and so it's great just applying the thing to every point in the array. Yeah, so k dot parentheses is applying the k function to every um, point in the array. So if I look at u0 of 1, and it's doing something in the background. Shouldn't have changed parameters unnecessary. So this is a Julia. Why is it okay? This is the Julia, Julia repo. Um, we have a package manager. I want to talk about this later. But no, no time as a present. Uh, and okay, I should have had this book before. Does this notebook is? It has gotten too large over time. I should have broken it up into multiple steps. So you can see up here there's a little progress bar where it says, hey, by the way, you changed many things. I'm ca still catching up. Um, and of course, this is also technical. OK, so I will come back to your answer, uh, the question in a second, and keep on talking. Um, so remember the pyramid, right? Right now, I was basically on the lowest level of the step. I was writing a for loop, I was doing everything explicitly manually, and if you're used to a dynamic programming language like MATLAB or Python, um, writing for loops is verboten. It's the worst thing you can possibly do, because that means everything is going to be interpreted. In Julia, it's fine. And the reason why it's fine is because we have a compiler in the, ba uh, in the background, which will actually analyze the function, optimize it, uh, and make it fast, if possible. Okay. OK, so now we have something, and I can't type. <coughs> so if you look at uh, the first value of the array, um, Dominic, and now I want to apply k over k is just a function that is going to do some type conversion. Um, and uh, it helpfully automatically plots this for me. It's basically just. Uh, and if I look at the type of, of this object, it's the image, uh, the, the, the color type K with the float64 stored in there, and then it's normalized between 0 and 1. Um, right. So we were at the lowest level of the abstraction um, layer, and we want to make our job slightly easier. We're going to move up. And so one of the things that always annoys me when I write these kinds of for loops is that if you look back, I didn't point this out, um, we have these special numbers in here, and they're weird. So like, we're going to have our outer boundary uh, be the uh, initial conditions or the boundary, the boundary conditions, 
and they are going to be at 1 and n. 1 because Julia starts at 1, not at 0, because we're dealing with indexes and not offsets. Um, but that means that everything has to start from 2 and go from n minus 1. And that's really weird. I, I, I would always like be like, huh? Why is this special? So one possible abstraction we could use is to use an offset array. An offset array takes your data and re-indexes it. So you can say, I want, um, where, do we where do we actually set it up, right? Here, I want to create an offset array based on the data that is mu zero, which is just my normal array. And I want it to start at zero and go to n plus one. And so now every time I do a minus one, um, I can do indexing like, without fearing to go out of bounds. Um, I can start at one and go to n, which looks much nicer. Um, and uh, I have my boundary zone at zero and n plus one instead of n plus two. As it's just a personal preference thing, but the, the point is that I can build these abstractions, and these abstractions are built purely in Julia. The second abstraction we're going to use is a view. A view is just taking a subset of the data and re-indexing to this point. So instead of doing the manual plus minus operations, what we can do is we can say, I want a view of the center from 1n to uh, 1m. And uh, I want a, a view that is shifted left. I want a view that is shifted right. I want a view that is shifted up. And I want a view that is shifted down. And then in my actual mathematical equation, and what down here, none of the indexing operations still appear. Well, I could have chosen better names. Like if I wanted, I could have called it south, north, west, east. I always find that confusing because why is north up? Um, <laughs> north should, could also be done. But uh, in any case, my equation simplifies. And it says <coughs> this add dot here in the font means every operation in here is a podcast, an element-wise operation. Um, and similar down here, I, this statement remains the same. Now, the question is, why would I want to do this? It doesn't look much better than before. Well, the question is, now I gained an abstraction layer, and I can do things like with GPU computing later. I can change the type of my data, and these operations will still work, despite me working on a GPU, despite me working um, with distributed memory. So by get, building an abstraction layer, I can generalize the problem a little bit, where I no longer reason about indexing locally. And by doing that, I gain the power of generalizing the algorithm to more diverse storage types. OK, so that's the problem. Um, now, if we look at flavors of parallelism, we can start with what we have locally, right? If you just execute code on a CPU, um, your, your CPU is going to be latency optimized. It is trying to get from uh, trying to get your sequence of operations done as fast as possible. Because it is latency optimized, it invests a lot of silicon space into capabilities. And so, if you ever want to have some keywords to look up these capabilities out of order, so despite you writing a sequential line of code, we might decide that one of them can be executed much earlier than the other one. And we decide that at runtime. So quite literally, inside our, the silicon that is running your program, there's a little just-in-time compiler re-optimizing your program. <laughs> um, it has very complicated and very deep cache hierarchies, and caches are really ma ma meant to make memory accesses efficient. So when computer scientists talk about cache oblivious or cache optimal algorithms, they really talk about, can I make the caches work as well as I possibly can? As David said yesterday, the really nice thing about a general purpose CPU is that it does a lot of work in order to make your stupid program run fast. The problem with a GPU is that it doesn't do any of the nice things. And so if you write a GPU program program wrong, it's much easier to be slow. Um, another thing that they do is branch prediction. And then the worst of all, and this has been in the news over the last couple of years, is that CPUs like to speculate. Speculation means looking ahead, executing something that you're not yet allowed to execute. Um, 
and that has a whole bunch of security issues, and that's why we've been losing performance. Thank you, Intel. Um, so your CPU is roughly 15% slower than it was five years ago. <laughs> and, but if you want to have a mental image, and I don't know how many people have seen a picture like this, um, you have inside your CPU, you have a computational core, and a computational core has a register file associated, so all of the local working memory that is really, really quick to access. And then there are a whole bunch of computational units. So there's an ALU, an algorithmic logic unit. Um, then you have a load and store unit. You might have two of them because they might be busy for long periods of time. So it might be blocked, so it might be good to have multiple of them you can choose in between. Then you have a floating point unit, and you might have more specialized units like um, uh, fused multiply add, vector units, matrix units. <coughs> gets more and more complicated. Um, and as I said, we have um, a multi-state cache hierarchy. So these load and store units talk to the cache. And if the value is in the cache, in the first level cache, you might get your answer within seven cycles. If it's in the second layer cache, you might get your answers within like tens of cycles. And if it has to go off chip, off core, to the DRAM memory, it's like hundreds, thousands of cycles potentially in order to get your memory load that you want to have to do. And that's why it's so important to think about memory because the cost of accessing and the, like while CPU speeds went up a lot, memory speeds went up linearly. So we've gotten faster, but the cost of memory accesses is the dominant cost in modern CPUs. Um, it's also the dominant energy cost. So if you look at a lot of modern uh, computer architecture papers, they talk about moving the compute to the data instead of moving the data to a centralized CPU. Now, one realization we had very early on, and this is another uh, theme in computer science, all good ideas come back. Um, so neural networks were hot in the 50s, then they were hot in the 80s, they're hot in the 2020s. Um, those are roughly the cycles of repetition, and then funding goes away because people make promises that they can't uh, cash in on, and uh, 20 years later, a PhD student has a good idea and makes it better. In any case, um, one of these ideas is vector-based programming, or as Intel likes to call it simply, single instructions, multiple data. The idea is that instead of doing operations over an individual piece of data, we can describe a singular operation that we want to do over multiple pieces of data. And if you've ever done any SIMD low-level programming in C and C++, it's a horrendous exercise with all of the different kind of intrinsics your compiler gives it. We've added a little bit of an abstraction, not a very complicated, it's a very shallow abstraction on top of that, um, where the operate in terms of a vector load and a vector store. And then the arithmetic operations are the same, so you don't need to use any intrinsics for that. We dispatch correctly to that. And so this little for loop basically <coughs> processes this random vector in a stride of four. So four de elements of data are picked out of my memory, loaded onto the CPU, I do my addition operation, and I store that. And why it's nice for somebody who thinks about computer architecture is that I have basically three instructions, but I do 12 operations. Yes? For those four elements that are loaded into memory, always contiguous in the original, like where they were loaded from? Yes, so if you do a vector load, it is always contiguous. And if you have non contiguous memory, you do a gather or scatter operation. So the question was whether or not we load and vStore uh, operate over continuous memory or not. Um, so this is an example of how you, what a vector gather and vector scatter would do. So this scatter takes my data that might be 1, 2, 3, 4, and then scatters them, exchanges the elements, and then stores them back. And I could have done this with non-continuous elements to swizzle event even more. So this is. Uh, what the program looks like in the order to make it less confusing, I had used 100 and 200, 300, 400 for the data. And so we have an index vector, how we want to access this big array, big four elements. Um, we then gather the data, and we see we get a vector of four integers. We have a little bit of special printing to make clear to you that you have a unit. And then we scatter it back, and it 
appears again in the same order. But, yes, Chris? Um, does your stride have to be fixed? So in this case, you've got four, and on another CD, you might want two or eight. So can you cope with a, a CPU architecture which I won't name for so the question is, that is the stride, has this stride to be fixed? And yes and no. So the stride is being used as a type parameter here. And so the compiler will assume that it is fixed. But can I, I can write a function where I, the stride is a type input, and then the function will be specialized on that stride. Um, if you have time later, remind me and I uh, will show you uh, how you would write that function. But the challenge in some ways, if we, what we are talking about simply here, is what happens if my code has a branch in it, my for loop has a branch. So I want to translate this scalar loop into, um, into a function that uses vectorized uh, instructions explicitly. Normally, you don't need to worry about doing it explicitly because your compiler is supposed to do it for you. Well, sometimes it won't. Um, and so one of the reasons why control flow is so hard is because we, the control flow is dependent on the data we are loading. So we can't just do it one way. We must do it both ways. And so the answer, and this is what compilers literally do, and uh, spoiler alert, that's what GPUs do in the end. Uh, we calculate a mask. We do the operation for both sides of the branch. And then we merge the result together with this vector if else here, and then store the result. So where you think, oh, it would be nice if I don't have to do this work in the uncommon case, let me put it into an if statement. Once you start thinking about vector architectures, like modern CPUs or like GPUs, uh, it, you realize that sometimes you might have to do the work anyway. So this is a single CPU core, and it has these vector units, so it has parallelism already in this single core level. If you go to a shared memory multi machine, a multi if you go to a shared memory system, also <coughs> called multi threading, we might have something that looks like this. This is my local laptop, and so man, it's not that great to see. So we have our compute cores down here. Um, these are the K cores. That's what we just talked about. And then we have the different caches. I have two different kinds of uh, L1 caches, one for data, one for instructions, then the L2. And then you can see that the L3 cache is much bigger than both the L2 caches. It's shared between the two cores. And then they have access to about 15 gigabytes of all system memory. Now, this little thing down here is the biggest marketing lie that Intel has ever sold us as a community. Um, these are called hyperthreads or um, shared simultaneous multithreading. Simultaneous multithreading is, in theory, great. In practice, not so much. Because we only have one physical core, but we present to the operating system that there are two virtual ones. And so when you do your scaling analysis and you want to show to your boss, that yes, my program is really fast. And then he is like, why is there a kick in the curve? So maybe I have a plot that looks like this. And this is one thread, this is two threads, this is four threads, and then we have six and eight. And the question is, why or why do we have this kink here? And it turns out that in most scientific codes, even if you're memory bound, like hyperthreading only gives you an additional 20, 40% of performance, it doesn't give you 2x. So depending on your code, you might have to worry about this, but at least if you see something that looks weird in your data, when you do a big presentation where you tell everybody that your code is the fastest, keep an eye out for this. In Julia, I can use, um, we've been adding better and uh, more uh, capabilities for multi-threading, and so they are all in this based on threads 
um, sub-module. One of the big mistakes was to call this based on threads instead of based on tasks. Um, because while the app threads macro can be used to multi-thread a for loop, what we actually do under the hood is we have tasks, and these tasks execute in parallel. And so I could now rewrite my manual for loop code, and I could drop down to that level of detail and say, I want to multi-thread um, across the outer dimension, and then I want to make sure that the compiler knows that it is legal to apply SIMD optimizations to the inner loop. Um, this IV DAP uh, is, is a extreme performance tuning. Uh, it's better to just leave it out. Um, and the other thing that I will point out at this point, we have these macros here, which are with the add symbol in front of them. And so we have an add flex, an add symbol, and an add inbounds. These are macros. So they take in an expression of code and transform it to something else. Um, so uh, Julia is somewhat of a lisp, and these are the explicit calls to use lisp-like functionality. And this add inbounds, is necessary because by default we are going to um, check that all of the memory accesses are in bounds and give you a nice error if you're in, uh, out of bounds instead, instead of returning random memory. So I can use um, at time or if I want to have more statistical relevant results at e time. Sorry, sorry, does inbounds say it don't do the runtime check? Yes. It's okay. saying, it, trust it, me, it's all good. It is an assertion that says, trust me, I know what I'm doing, I'm e height. Let me go on to a slide. Um, <laughs> and so I can, um, we have measurement facilities in Julia to show, uh, to compare whether or not performance improves. There is the at time macro. The at time macro executes your code once. The at B time macro is from a package called Benchmark uh, Tools, which we call later, which will execute your code a lot of times to um, create a statistical sample and then report uh, the average. And so we can see, yes, multi-threading indeed gives us a nice speed up. Um, this is what I pointed out earlier. We don't just have a threads, so we're not confined to the limits of for loops. Under the hood, everything is using at spawn, which creates a new task. It puts a task to the scheduler. The scheduler will pick it up eventually and run it on the parallel course you have. And so if you want to synchronize uh, something that you spawn off, you can either use syntactic synchronization, so this will synchronize everything in the scope, or you can write some more low-level functions like Fibonacci, very low level, where I spawn off one side of the computation, then do the other side of the computation, and then fetch the result of the other uh, side that I spawned off. So it's if you ever worked with in C with TBB um, or OpenMP tasks or any of these things, um, we have. Oh, in, in Python you have the async um, code. That's all very similar. Now. In distributed programming, we go back to our original picture and we remember that we did some kind of stencil. We have these boundary layers. Right? This is our interior region, this is our boundary layer. And the thing to remember is that it really doesn't matter what you do in, in on the inside here. The only thing that you should need to exchange between nodes is that boundary layer. Um, now, uh, it is notoriously difficult to get MPI working in notebooks, so I'm not going to do this here. But there's a nice package called Implicit Global Good in Julia, which sets up um, basically a, a, a grid of uh, MPI ranks. So MPI is the message passing interface uh, that is used on HPC systems a lot. And it sets up a grid of these processes and it automates the communication stack. So instead of having to say, update our boundary conditions here, I can leave it up to the package and say, hey, by the way, update the halo. I would like to communicate now and uh, communicate the information across the network. Um, and a lot of people write their first 
boundaries change code themselves. While I would recommend it as an educational exercise, I wouldn't recommend it as an implementation for an actual scientific code. Um, if you are comfortable with low-level distributed programming and you like to have access to all of the things that MPI provides you, we've been working for as long as Julia exists on building MPI.gl, which is a web around MPI and it deals with all of the wonderful details of dealing with MPI. Now, my bread and butter is GPU programming. Um, we started out uh, seven, eight years ago now to build this package we call CUDA.gl to allow to program G GPUs from NVIDIA directly in Julia. And what I mean by that is that you can take a Julia function, provide it to an array abstraction like MapReduce, and we compile that Julia function directly to the hardware. So um, in NumPy, there are UDFs, I think, a number tries to do something very similar, but it turns out that it's the ability to compile the user's code directly to the hardware is very powerful. And so over the years, you know, the community has had a much, an explosion of different vendors who are trying to provide a hardware for GPU programming, and so AMD is the biggest name. Intel is trying to convince us all that they have GPUs. Um, we have yet to see some chip ship to us, uh, and then this is not AMD again, this is Apple. <laughs> so Apple is also now, if you're buying a new M1, M2 uh, laptop, you're getting a very powerful, nice GPU in there, but it's not, you need a different programming model to make them work. And so sometimes I get asked the question, why the heck are there four different packages? Why is there not just one GPU.gl? Um, and it turns out that the capabilities of the hardware is subtly different um, on the lower low level. The capabilities of the ecosystem is very different. So some vendors provide excellent packages, other ones don't. Um, and so trying to unify everything you would lose the ability to do low, low level programming. Um, but all of these packages share a common compiler infrastructure. They provide the same high level array based programming model. That's why my podcast infrastructure just works. Um, and I've been working on this package called kernel instructions for Klima uh, that allows you to wind a GPU kernel, a low level GPU kernel, access shared memory, and all of these other capabilities, um, but then have it be translated between the different vendors automatically. So if you haven't done any GPU programming and the only thing you know about GPUs is that they magically make, make machine learning faster, and possible. Um, I have a couple of points what GPUs are, but the big notion is a CPU is like a professor. Le it labors industrially and cleverly and uh, schedules their work very well. A GPU is like a, a lecture hall full of undergrads. They all kind of do the same work, maybe sometimes very fast, but they don't think ahead very, uh, very far either. And so a GPU is a throughput optimized device with a lot of simple cores that doesn't do all of this predictive reasoning, all of the out of order execution, even though that might be changing. Um, but instead of having one core or eight cores on your system, you have 64 cores with each hundreds of threads. And so um, you have a programmable cache IP that is shared memory. Your uh, kernels will require, so kernels are GPU programs. They require a number of register that is changeable. So instead of like on a CPU, you have a limited number of registers available to you. On the GPU side, you can scale up and down. But if you use a lot of registers, you have low occupancy. That means that you can't maximize the parallelism of the device. And then there is this little thing that in the literature is called branch divergence. And they explain it very complicated. But it boils down to the same notion that we talked about in simply programming. When you have a vector unit, and that's what GPUs are, you have vectors of 64 elements, and you, um, and you have, encounter a branch 
you need to execute both sides of the branch. And so branch divergence is the ratio of how much do I need to do this work. But if I have no branch divergence, then the branch did not fire for my entire vector. If I have high branch divergence, then I needed 50% of my vector needed to go left, 50% of my vector needed to go right. But the sad truth is, if only one element of my vector needs to go right, we have to execute the entire right side of the kit. Um, and then there's this little thing about memory accesses should be coalesced. That is also just boils down. If you think about vectors and vector accesses, you don't want to do gathers. You don't want to pick memory all over the place. You want your memory to be chunked um, so that memory accesses to be chunked so that the cost of the memory access can be shared between neighboring elements in the compute hierarchy. Um, maybe an assigned uh, the structure of a GPU on the hardware side and the programming structure we expose to the user are different. And so on the programming side, we have threads, which are a single element, and we program a GPU from the perspective of a thread. And then we group these threads into blocks. Blocks have access to shared resources. But how those blocks and threads map onto the hardware is a little bit more complicated, and we'll skip that in the interest of time. But Instead of my wonderfully hand-drawn figure earlier, this is the official NVIDIA architecture for V100. And it's horrendously complicated um, and not very insightful. But the thing to remember is, oh, we have something like an L2 cache again. Oh, we have access to um, external memory. Um, and there are, yeah. And then we have inside here our actual compute elements. And so these are called shader multiprocessors. And so if you look at an SM in detail, we suddenly see things that we talked about before. We have a register file here. We have these special units, tensor cores, which are used for machine learning. Then we have floating point units, we have integer units, and down here we have load and store units, and then we have a special function unit. And these are basically the physical resources that are shared across which your program is going to be scheduled. And because we didn't spend much silicon space on predictive capability, we can spend all our silicon space on just throwing in more computational resources. And so in a GPU, the bottleneck is always memory. So because my laptop has an Intel GPU and I wanted to have an adventure, and I'm using the one API package uh, to access my Intel GPU. I load two other packages, so not that important. And now I can move my data that I have, or literally the same data, I can move it to the GPU. And this movement is always explicit in Julia. Because we have found that that data movement really is the bottleneck, and we don't want to balance memory back and forth between the host and Julia. And so if I look at the type of my, the data that I have now, I can see that on the outside I have an offset matrix. And then on the inside I have a one matrix, which is a GPU matrix of type load 64. Then I put in some hacks, because it turns out that this package is not, not quite ready for Prime yet. And I, we need to fix some things. Um, but um, I always have to move the data back to the CPU to do some visualization. So this adapter right here, and then the cry call is the same thing that we did before. I'm uh, moving the data back to the host, just to ch check my data is actually the same. And notice that I haven't changed anything about my code except this data movement back. I'm still calling my same um, function that is using my array abstraction to implement my diffusion kernel, but the only thing I really changed is that I now give it GPU memory. And this is this notion that we want to move the computation to the memory instead of moving the data back to the host. And so because of the array abstraction, I can easily do this transformation in my libraries that I provide for my users instead of um, the user being like, oh, by the way, I have a for loop here, and this for loop is not actually translatable to GPU memory, uh, to GPU programming. Um, the other thing, uh, maybe I should have pointed this out earlier, this little error here is a lambda. So um, this 
is a, I'm creating an anonymous function that takes in a singular argument and takes all of these other parameters away so that I don't need to worry about them. Now, how would this look like if I actually were to use low-level GPU programming? Um, since I don't know how to program an Intel GPU, I'm using my performance portability abstraction. So, um, colon abstractions, and then we have to load the back end so that we can target Intel GPUs. And then here we have what I talked about is we have these, um, the perspective of programming a single thread. So I, comma J, so I'm accessing the indices of, uh, of the code that I'm accessing, um, and then I can write the same code that we saw earlier, basically, verbatim, and suddenly I have a GPU program. Um, I need to set it up because GPU programming is naturally asynchronous. We have these wait calls here, and I'm instantiating my kernel for my compute device with some configuration options, and then I'm executing it actually. And then it turns out that manually doing it right now is a tiny bit slower than doing it um, uh, automatically, so I need to investigate by reducing performance. Um, but it's in the same neighborhood, which means we're doing roughly the same work. Okay, so this is my parallelism part. And it took longer than expected. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of an advertising of why Julia. Um, on the highest level, it is a dynamic programming language, and so if you're comfortable with Python, you might be really comfortable with Julia. But under the hood, uh, it gives you capabilities that are more like this, and the performance you can get, not by default, because you'll still need to do some work, is like C. And it, it does this by having a just-in-time, ahead-of-time compiler in the background. The other nice feature that I really enjoy is that most of Julia is written in Julia, so I can debug it. I don't need to learn a new language in order to understand what is happening and what the libraries are doing underneath the hood. Stephen Johnson, the uh, creator of uh, FFTW, at one point complained and said, I filed a bug report with MATLAB, with MathWorks, 15 years ago. I could have fixed it myself, but I can't because it's closed source and written in a different language. They haven't fixed it in 15 years. Every year I remind them. You might still have the same problem in Julia, but at least everything is open source and it's written in the same language, so you should be able to fix it. Um, and then reflection and metaprogramming are really capable tools to, um, to allow you to explore programs and to write programs that write programs which is really great because we are all hopefully lazy people, uh, and lazy people try to do smart decisions and um, not write too much code themselves. Um, my advisor, uh, Alan Edelman, is a mathematician, and one of the missions that he has with Julia is to have code that is close to the mathematic mathematics. Sometimes we achieve that, sometimes we hilariously fail at that, but that is a different uh, challenge. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to highlight is um, because we're all in one language, it somewhat lowers the social barrier between uh, research software engineers and users of applications. So the, the boundaries between developer and users become a lot shallower, and we've seen a lot of fruitful interactions um, between people who want to add features and uh, um, contribute to the language and to the package ecosystem. And the other thing is we have a really great package manager. Um, uh, and uh, we focus on reproducibility as a first principle, and there are not five options, there's one option, and everybody uses it. Um, so, reflection. Um, the general way of how compilation works in Julia is we take a code, we translate it into an abstract syntax tree, we do some work on an intermediate representation, we look at all of the types, we then lower and optimize this with LVM, which is a common infrastructure in HPC computing these days, and then we lower it to assembly and run it on the computer. So if I have this very stupid my sum function, I can ask the compiler, what do you think of it? And so one of the first markers I can use, I can look at the lower code, and you can see that we, we don't know much, but it is in a form that as a compiler I like, as a human I can vary it. 
Um, and that is the motto of everything else. It's like it's human digestible, but not to the liking of humans. We are simplifying the computation problem. And now I can do type inference over it. And what that means is I take the input signature of the function and I propagate those types down uh, through my program. And so you can see that now I know that the um, accumulate um, operation will always yield a float 64. And um, the condition variables are hoodies and so forth. I can then also run some optimizations over it, and then we will basically do inlining and some uh, easy optimization at this point. Um, and then after the fact, I can look at the code. So this is not that nice visibly, but this is our VMIR, and I can directly in introspect what the compiler did for my single function. And this is very powerful to figure out why my code isn't fast. Now, one thing to note here is there are no vector instructions happening. And so because floating point semantics, I actually need to have the AdSimD here in order to get vectorization to kick off. Um, because floating points, I can't arbitrarily reorder. But you can then see in the code, not really, that you have these brackets for x double occurring, which means that the compiler decided to automatically vectorize your code. Now, um, before I do all of this work to reflect, I should actually spend some time benchmarking. And so we have uh, some nice tooling for that, and we added automatic printing of histograms because it turns out that computers are bad, and sometimes they have power spikes and power curves, and so if you just execute your function once, you get some number, but is that number actually representative of your program? And so we do uh, five seconds of executing your program in, in a loop, and we then tell you the statistics of that. Um, we have profiling built into the language. So using profile pulls in the standard library for profiling. Then I can use uh, profile canvas to look at it as an example here in my, um, in my Pluto notebook. You notice there is a horrendously deep call stack that I don't care about. I want to look at this level and I can then see where I'm actually spending most of my time. It's not that helpful for this code, but generally. Uh, we have integration with um, HPC tools like Liquid or Curve, um, and I, so I can actually then look at how many floating point operations per second is my code actually doing. Um, and so lastly, and uh, doing a uh, point landing, therefore by skipping a lot of other things, um, one thing I've been working on uh, over the last three years is uh, to enable automatic differentiation of science codes. And so earlier we talked about automatic differentiation for um, machine learning. And the reason why all of the ML community is obsessed with graphs is because graphs make AD easy. Um, it turns out that scientists um, wrote a lot of code over the last 40 years. Um, and almost none of them map nicely to these graphs or would in, uh, require a lot of investment to invite them into one of those frameworks. And then, of course, the question is which framework do I choose? And everybody disagrees about that. So, you know. Um, Enzyme um, is a project uh, started by me and William, Mo William Moses at MIT. And it does the automatic differentiation on the LVM level. So on the lower level, not on Julia itself. And by doing that, we can also differentiate C and C++ code, Fortran codes, Swift code, Rust code. Um, and we are building a common infrastructure for doing AD over science-based code. And really, that's the niche we are going after, because the machine learning crowd is very popular. Um, and so what makes a science code typical? And um, then you don't, not going to like that typical. A science code is, has mutations. It is not functional and pure. So right, this operation here, this assignment operation, it's a memory a a array. That is the, the operation that machine learning toolkits can't represent well. Um, and the other thing that they can't do well is control flow. Control flow are, are across <coughs> many small operations. And so the reason for that is really just that the design decisions made for the AD toolkits is to focus on 
very large costly operation. So the ID toolkit doesn't need to be implemented in the most optimal way because it is a very, very small portion of the total runtime. Um, and my problem is always I'm looking for reasonable examples. Well, this in this example, I'm having an in-place diffusion where I'm updating where the output is passed in as an argument as well. Um, and now I can set up um, some, I want to get the gradient of my input. So I'm going to set up my input, and then I'm going to propagate a gradient in for my output. This is always what is happening in reverse mode ID, that I have some output gradient, I have an input gradient, and see exact reverse to your input and output argument in the forward path. And so I can then call alternative with reverse, pass it in that I want to differentiate the function in place diffusion, and then I have these two arguments where I say the gradient of ut store in your dut, and um, or the gradient argument for ut is in dot and the gradient argument for du is for du uh, and use not and um, depending on what the code is doing uh, the output is going to be in this case in du not and so this is now some output because the gradient that I'm passing in is some random and at this point I have the hour and um, I I'm open for question, or I could uh, keep talking uh, for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> Let's do some questions. Compressing three lectures into one is a lot of material. <laughs> yes? In your threading implementation, yes. do, you, do you handle the scheme of the threads to the cross, or is it left to the users to do it correctly? So the question is, um, in our threading implementations, how do we handle pinning? Um, since pinning is somewhat application specific, it is left to the user. There is an environment flag called Julia underscore exclusive, exclusive equals one, which will pin to a default pattern. Uh, but then there is a package called thread pinning that allows you to specify at runtime a different pinning pattern that you might want, or you use any of the Linux pinning tools to pin. The only thing you need to keep in mind is that we start class by default, we load an open class implementation, and so that also wants some threads, and yeah. So I have a question. How is the um, performance predict predictability uh, with Julia? Is it sort of, uh, is it continuous? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Changes in the code. So this is in some way um, why I emphasize the reflection capabilities, because they allow you to understand and look at, okay, what is my code actually doing? What is the compiler thinking of my code? Um, in contrast to other just-in-time compilers, we don't do any tracing, so you don't have any changes in performance while the code is running. So when you introspect the code, that is the code we're going to execute. Now, performance uh, predictability, uh, I think with the right model in your head is there, but it takes a little bit of learning because there is this issue of so-called type stability. Um, if your code is doing dynamic work, you might not have nice LVMIR in the end, so you need to learn, oh, these are the three things I can't do. We have ex exhaustive performance tips and tricks on the website that point out common pitfalls we uh, people encounter. So I guess being uh, not doing tracing, you don't get the... Uh uh, yes, I've, I've, I've written scientific codes in Java before, and uh, it was very entertaining because of that. Okay, any other questions? I think everybody wants to go to lunch. Yeah. Oh, no. Asper doesn't.
<laughs> from, a, from API, you showed that you can very can distribute into a grid. Yeah. Do you handle any more complicated topologies like web sheets? Um, no. I don't think implicit global grid does something more complicated right now. I think they could add it. Um, but the point for me is this is a package developed by a, uh, somebody at ETH. Um, and so it really isn't part of the language, so it's not hard to change. Great, right, that's thank God again. <laughs> <laughs>